Good morning and welcome to Morning Movie News, where Disney had yet another announcement this morning, but this one was a bit of a surprise, and that's that they gave the release dates for The Last Jedi, both digital and the hard copy release date, and they're really freaking soon. The digital copy will release March 13th, mere weeks away, uh, and then the hard copy will come out on March 27th. And I know a number of you like to wait to get the hard copy, but I don't think you're going to be able to wait, although piracy will be huge, because they're releasing 14 deleted scenes uh, digitally on March 13th, and I think that no one's going to be able to wait uh, the extra days for that hard copy, at least not the hardcore fans. I guess that's my first question for you. Will you wait to get the copy, considering um, the time lapse and wanting to get your hands on, or your eyeballs on those 14 deleted scenes? Now, I feel that this makes Star Wars take yet another step closer to the DCEU. And I'm surprised that they would do this. Now, I feel that Ryan Johnson is doing this because he wants to be vindicated. He blinked hardcore when it came to The Last Jedi and standing his creative ground. He was tweeting people back. He was getting into fights. Uh, he was throwing a little shade. Uh, and I think, I think he just should have said, this is my vision. They p Kathleen Kennedy loves me, guys. I'm not going anywhere. Well, we'll see. They still say they're making his trilogy. I don't know. I'm, I think it might be like that in Humans movie that Kevin Feige said he was going to make for the longest time. But we'll see. I guess we'll see how these 14 deleted scenes are received. And he has told many people that he had to cut a lot of stuff for time from the movie, right? So this reminds me, of course, of the Batman v Superman Ultimate Edition, uh, which had basically a different movie that they made available to the public. But there was never a consensus on which was the better version. I hate the Ultimate Edition. I think that it tries to Speaking of vindication, it tries to vind vindicate Superman, and I really uh, had a problem backtracking on that. I thought that Superman not being a perfect person in the DCEU is one of my favorite, most sophisticated things about it. So, if, you know, if you try and make him and Lois look like they actually know what they're doing, uh, this Batman fan has a problem with it. <laughs> I know that Super... I mean, even for Superman fans, I don't think they were like, yes, that's exactly what I wanted. They were like, that's better, but it's still not great. And also what ended up happening was there was just no definitive version of the film. It makes these, this world seem more like a work, a fluctuating work in progress rather than a set story. And I think that that vagueness hurt the DCEU in the long run. And I don't know why they would ever want to have that happen potentially to Star Wars. So the question is, will these 14 deleted scenes change the movie like the Batman v Superman deleted scenes did? Or will it just flesh out and hopefully maybe he feels better explained Ryan Johnson's decisions. Uh, of course, I want to see them and I will cover them. Uh, everybody, I mean, I think they're going to be hugely talked about. That's the big problem, which we'll discuss in just a moment. But I will say that I don't think that Ryan Johnson or Kathleen Kennedy should have released them. I don't think that's, a, I think it was, a, it's going to be a mistake. I think it's important to move forward. Picture is locked. That is an industry term in editing. Uh, and I think it should be respected. I think it's occasionally okay to have I think it was okay. I mean, they used to have deleted scenes. Like, that used to be a thing. But it never fundamentally changed the movies. And also, these things weren't so hotly debated then. Because here's what's going to happen. The debate is going to be reignited about the quality of The Last Jedi. And you're going to either have, they should have kept those scenes, or still didn't fix it, or maybe even made it worse, right? I think they should just focus on Solo, which looks surprisingly promising out of the gate. And so I think to go to step backward, it's like Kylo Ren says. Maybe that's why I like Kylo Ren so much. He's like, kill the past, burn it, you know, move ahead. And I'm like, you know, I think there's something, to, there's some truth to what Kylo's saying over there, right? Maybe we just shouldn't do it literally, Kylo. Maybe you should just, you know, just like you did before, stop talking to your parents. Okay, all right, so that's the first story of the day. And I'm very curious about your thoughts on that. Now for the second one, as I tweeted yesterday, wow, Disney didn't waste any time getting Black Panther into their theme parks. Introducing a meet and greet with Black Panther, complete with Dora Milaje at Disney's California Adventure over at Disneyland. It looks so cool. Doesn't that look amazing? The Dora Milaje look particularly, like all, all of them, Black Panther and the Dora Milaje look like they leapt off the screen, which is pretty impressive. Although as many of you said, boy, that poor actor playing Black Panther must be so hot in that suit. Uh, hopefully they keep him in a nice, cool, air-conditioned area. And the, the, the Avengers van they're using was actually used last summer for a Black Widow meet and greet that they had at the theme park. So they're getting a lot of use out of that van. 
So I think that with the record-breaking opening weekend and this ultra-fast development, they were able to put them in the parks immediately. I feel very strongly that Disney will build a Wakanda land at their Animal Kingdom Park in Orlando. Not a Marvel land, specifically Wakanda. They are building a Marvel land in Hong Kong Disneyland, which looks amazing. I've recently tweeted about that as well. And I would imagine they'll probably build a Marvel land at some point at Disney's California Adventure. Uh, and I'm sure about this because it's just such an obviously good idea. I mean, Animal Kingdom already has an Africa land, for reals, all right? And it's all about, about the celebration of the continent. That's like a big part of what Animal Kingdom is supposed to represent. And I think it does effectively do that. Uh, and also, the Pandora add-on has been a huge success uh, to Animal Kingdom. So I think they would want to, you know, just like Hollywood Studios is getting two new lands, Toy Story Land and Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, I think the Animal Kingdom would be complete with two destinations, Pandora and Wakanda. And they would also help take the pressure off of each other because they're both such must-sees. As I've said before, Flights of Passage at Pandora Land is the best ride I've ever been on. But who knows what the Black Panther ride will be like? Maybe that'll become the best ride. I think it should have at least probably two rides, shops, uh, a restaurant with a character uh, meet and greet, you know, character dining experience. That would be fantastic, right? Stage shows. Who wouldn't love to see, you know, just like they do the Star Wars changing of the guard with um, uh, Captain Phasma and the Stormtroopers. Who wouldn't love to see the Dora Milaje marching through uh, Wakanda land? It would be amazing. Although they'd have to be, of course, with Black Panther because they're the royal guard. But I love it so much. I mean, Disney already works very hard to appeal to the black community to come to the theme parks. And I think based on... Um, how much the black community has, I mean, everybody has, but the black community in particular have embraced Black Panther. Uh, I mean, they're using it, for instance, to encourage people in the black community to register to vote. I mean, it's this huge movement, as we've discussed. Uh, and so it would, I think a Wakanda land in Orlando would make going to that theme park a must-see destination. And, you know, we all know how much the mass ass likes, likes money. And I think they would just be printing money. But here's a question that occurred to me. Could only black employees work at Wakanda land? I could see that being a really tricky legal issue for Disney. Uh, I mean, as you see in the movie, Wakanda um, will be letting in different people into their country, right? Uh, Bucky's already there. Uh, and so they will, I think, just because that's what happens with immigration, become a diverse country in their, um, in their uh, demographic makeup. But, you know, if, if, as I just said, they want this to appeal to the black community. I'm not sure how visitors would respond if they were to show up at Wakanda Land and then a white employee was like, welcome to Wakanda Land. You know, <laughs> that would be a real uh, WTF moment. Uh, maybe you can just put them not at the entrance to the land. But I'm curious how you would feel about that as well. I mean, I 110% would like to go to Wakanda Land. I think it's, it could be as popular as Star Wars Galaxy's Edge, uh, but I think that because of the political elements of the movie, uh, it would be a little tricky. Also, by the way, with Moana, remember they tried to make costumes, uh, you know, uh, Maui uh, co uh, costumes, uh, Dwayne Johnson's character, uh, and everybody got very upset, and they said, you know, don't, you know, our, our culture isn't, you know, a costume for, for people, particularly white people. Uh, and so maybe people would be like, you know, when they see white white tourists going to Wakanda land and enjoying the stage shows and the character greeting, would you get angry comments then? Um, I think that would obviously not be good. Uh, but I think, for the most part, people would be really into it, and I think Disney should go for it. I think it would be wonderful. All right, so that's the second story of the day. Now, the third is that the BAFTA Awards were this weekend, and the biggest headline that came out of them, actually, was that Jennifer Lawrence stepped in it again rude to host Joanna Lumley. What happened was is that Joanna Lumley intro introduced the show. Jennifer Lawrence, it turns out, was like the first presenter. And they had written something for Joanna Lumley where she was like, oh, this actress is the hottest actress in Hollywood. She can be like in any movie she wants. A lot of accolades, basically. And then Jennifer Lawrence came up and she was like, I think that was a bit much, Joanna. And everyone was like, whoa, she was just being nice to you, you know? And um, she came under a lot of fire. And she spent the next couple of days explaining what she meant. And I think it's understandable what she meant. Uh, you know, Jennifer Lawrence doesn't want anyone to think that she's vain enough to believe all that, right? And so she, I think she wanted to... I think she wanted to, to step it back a little bit, but she didn't do it demurely. She tried to do it like in a funny, keep it real way. And I think it backfired. And I think she continues to struggle to walk that fine line between keeping it real and being rude. Uh, and she really maybe should have her publicist, you know, talk to her about maybe some, some ground rules for how to uh, handle herself at these public events. Uh, but as for the award se as for award season, the BAFTAs just reinforce what we're all expecting. And that's three billboards uh, for best movie, uh, also best British film. I mean, I know Martin McDonough 
is from the region, but still, that movie doesn't take place in the UK. I, I, Paddington 2 was nominated, and I think Paddington 2 was robbed, <laughs> especially since Three Billboards already won Best Picture. Uh, but then, <clears throat> speaking of democratically spreading these awards out, uh, Shape of Water is not really winning any of the big awards, but they decided in the award-giving community to give it director. So, of course, Del Toro won director. Uh, Frances McDormand, Best Actress. Gary Oldman, Best Actor. Allison Janney, Best Supporting Actress. Sam Rockwell, Best Supporting Actor. Your Oscar ballot, you know, is going to get really easy to fill out, uh, you know, before you watch the big show. I, I wonder if there will be any surprises. I highly doubt it. So I'm wondering, have you come around on three billboards yet? Or, you know, I have. I came around like within just a few days of seeing it. But I have to say, now that Black Panther is a fire uh, at the box office and in public discussion, three billboards already seems a bit dated in its message, right? I mean, we're, I guess we're moving forward so quickly in our, our so uh, you know, our, um, our social dis and political discussions these days, it's hard for the entertainment industry to keep up. And so I continue to think the Oscars are just way too late. They're going to be giving that movie an Oscar on March 4th, uh, when we'll probably be talking about something else even at that point. Uh, I, think they, I think it's always historically been on that date, but I think they don't move it up because they want the movies to be available on streaming so people will go and, and get them after they win Oscars. But I don't think it's working out. They should significantly move up the Oscars. Uh, quite frankly, I would maybe even consider putting them in December uh, to get in front of the Golden Globes. So anyway, I'm curious what you think. Uh, what do you think of the finality of who's going to win? And when do you think the Oscars should be held? Um, and, you know, because they're so behind in the discussion. All right, now, speaking of Black Panther, uh, I, on Movie Math, I talked about the demographic breakdown of who attended the movie. And a number of you said, and I get asked this all the time, but I'm going to clarify it and give you the most in-depth answer I've ever given to this question. And that's how the heck do they know who's seeing the movie? Nobody asked me for my ethnicity, uh, gender, and age when I bought my ticket. So how do they know? Well, it's like exit polling. You know, when for the you know exit polling, of course, was infamously wrong at the last presidential election here in the United States. But for the most part, exit polling is effective in politics. And so they can have a general idea of how things are shaping up. So they do the same thing for movies. But it's not like some special interest group or a news outlet. It's a private service that the studios hire because they want to know who's seeing their movie. Not only who's seeing it, but who likes it. So that they can tailor um, their advertising, because they don't want to waste their money, uh, towards the right group. So they can shift. And so uh, Cinema Score, you might think it's Cinema Score uh, that gets the grade. No, Cinema Score does ask for group and gender but they don't ask for ethnicity. That comes from a company called Post Track. They have a website, you can go look Post Track up. And on that website, they say that Post Track, Post Track clients can ultimately use this service to better leverage opening weekend audience reactions and decide how to adjust messaging with greater immediacy using real-time box office and polling data. That means like on Saturday, Saturday morning, after getting the Friday information, they could start to target certain groups. They're like, look who's turning out. Or maybe they could be like, look who isn't turning out. Let's target them and try and get them to go to the movies, right? So you're getting a basic idea of how it works. So Post Track asks for your age, uh, your age group, your gender, and your ethnicity. They also ask why you attended, would you recommend the movie, do you plan to purchase or rent, and they do this in about 20 markets nationwide. Uh, again, just like what's done with voting. And they do it throughout the weekend, the opening weekend, and that's how you start to get those uh, demographics. And some people some people said that I only reported it for Black Panther. Uh, I appreciate you tuning into Movie Math. Uh, you know, if you're watching this show, you regularly watch. Uh, but I just wanted to reiterate that I often talk about the demographic breakdown. It's very important to Hollywood. Uh, uh, because that's how advertising is broken down. Uh, channels, uh, you know, it's very much, you know, you might not be aware of this, but all businesses are aware of the habits of the viewing public and the different groups within the viewing public of what, what channels they like, what shows, uh, etc. And that's so they know how to spend their money and to target uh, the specific audience that they, they're going after. All right, so that's today's morning movie news. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please write down below think today's top three stories, the viewer question, anything you'd like to see covered tomorrow, and of course, any questions that you might have. Thanks for watching. Bye.